Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our environmental learning series event tonight. My name is Tony McDowell. I'm the executive director of EarthPlace, and it's my privilege to introduce tonight's event and speaker, who is either on my right or left, I can't tell, depending on the technology. But we'll get to Wawa in, in a few minutes. For the past eight years, the environmental learning series has enjoyed a special collaboration with Sustainable Westport and EarthPlace. This fall, the partnership became even closer with Sustainable Westport officially uh, becoming part of EarthPlace as a nonprofit community resource. They are still dedicated to the town goal of becoming net zero by 2050, but now able to involve many more volunteers to work on community awareness and engagement across a wide spectrum of sustainability issues. Check out their website for more details. We also welcome Team Westport tonight and the Westport Library as our new partner in hosting the series and tonight's virtual event. Following Wawa's remarks, there will be a short Q&A and discussion where she'll be joined by David Mann, former chair of Sustainable Westport and Harold Bailey, chair of Team uh, Westport. And Jennifer Keller from the Westport Library who will be monitoring questions in the audience and you'll hear her pop in later on. And you can ask those questions through the CADCAST portal. So, Wanjiku Wawa Gatheru, 22 year, years old, environmental justice advocate, passionate about creating a more inclusive environmental movement, She's a recent graduate of the University of Connecticut, where she actually was friends with a new Harbor Watch employee at EarthPlace, Mary Donato. So thank you, Mary, for the introduction. It's really cool. Well, I was the founder of Black Girl Environmentalist and has bylines in Vice News and Glamour Magazine. And you may have seen the article in Glamour. Well, I was also the first Black person in history to receive the Rhodes, Truman, and Udall scholarships, which is an amazing accomplishment and hopefully she'll talk a little bit about that. But I'll let her tell about her life and her road and welcome to Stormy Westport, Juan. Oh. Awesome. Well, hi everyone. Um, I was just talking before in the green room that I'm really um, excited by this talk. I feel really, really honored to have been brought on here and also, I'm feeling very thankful that I am looking at myself right now because I think I would you know, be more and more nervous if I saw all 160 plus of y'all. But thank you for tuning in. I'm so excited to engage in this dialogue. So uh, my name is Wunjoko Gethero, friends call me Wawa, and I am a 22 year old environmental justice advocate. Um, I also present a sister, a daughter, a friend, and a lifelong Connecticut resident. I grew up in Putnam and Pomfret, Connecticut, go quiet corner. Um, and I'd also like to thank Earth Play, Sustainable Westport, and Westport Library for inviting me to take part in the environmental learning series. I think having, um, being given the opportunity to have a platform to talk about a topic that's so deeply intertwined with my work, but most importantly, um, fundamental to the way that I think about the world and, and my heart is so important. And I think it's great that I've been given this platform. So I'm going to see if I can share my screen so I can start my presentation. Okay. Ah, okay, now I can share. Oh, not share. You'd think that I'd be technologically savvy by now, but I am not. <laughs> so this is the beginning of my presentation. Uh, as y'all know, it's called to be an environmentalist, start with anti-racism. So to begin, I want to start with a quote that I found a lot of solace in now more than ever, and it is this. What if this darkness is not the darkness of the tomb, but the darkness of the womb? Valerie Crum. So I know these past couple years, especially this one, particularly this one, has been really, really dark for arguably all of us. There we go. We're in the midst of compounded crises, systematic racism, a once in a century pandemic, and a climate crisis. What's even more terrifying is that the problems that we encounter right now are absolutely not new. They've only been revealed to the broader public via many reasons, but namely access to large digital media and inclusive, the inclusive, discretion, the inclusive destruction that COVID has embraced. <clears throat> 
this year and arguably the past couple have called into question many of the things that I had before taking for granted. I've seen my values challenged, my purpose tested, and what's terrifying is that it hasn't been me alone. Almost everyone I care about has been and or is still in the same tumultuous boat. However, despite the crushing circumstances, I've got a lot of hope in seeing the way that an era of catastrophes have motivated so many people, including myself, to create space to learn and grow. In this past year alone, uh, we've all seen a historic wave of activism and a willingness to engage in uncomfortable conversations and dialogue. However, we must acknowledge that these moments haven't just sprung up out of thin air. Hope is never free, and it's always something that people have to pay for. This all has happened because people have chosen to act and in order to sustain this air of change, we have to be proactive as well, which leads me to this conversation and ensuring that the environmental movement is as inclusive as possible, not as a fad, not as a part of virtue signaling, but as a fundamental part of a successful movement that is capable of creating a climate future that is for all of us. So I get this question a lot, and I think it's a bit funny. Um, <laughs> I have people ask me all the time, I think with varying uh, reasons for asking me, they say, why the environmental movement? I think sometimes people ask me, why did you choose to be an environmentalist? Why have you chosen to pick on the environmental movement? I think that's where uh, the question comes from a lot. Uh, a lot of people say, well, the environmental movement isn't a place that has really been a home to racism. And I know some of you might be thinking yourself, why the environmental movement? Well, why are you always talking about the environmental movement and its need to become more inclusive? Well, I will agree. For the most part, environmentalists are arguably some of the most open-minded, forward-thinking people around, not to do my own work. <laughs> um, but environmentalists are people who believe in preserving the planet for generations. You buy reusable cups, use plastic, don't use plastic straws, we wear ethically made clothing and have a history fundamentally aligned with advocacy. However, it's not a perfect history. The environmental movement has not been a fundamentally anti-racist one and arguably still isn't. While its intentions have been largely positive, it has often excluded the most vulnerable, particularly black and brown communities and the poor. When we think about the genesis of the environmental movement, there is a mainstream history that we acknowledge and uplift. And I can say that for sure, there is an environmental movement history that is taught to us uh, you know, in our schools. I was an environmental studies major, the University of Connecticut, go UConn, I'm wrapping my head over here. Um, but there is a one-sided environmental history that is uplifted and toted as the true fundamental history. And that history and story goes something like this. Now, I'm not going to go through every one of these different markers, but I will discuss some of them, even some of them that aren't on this image. Uh, so, you know, we talked about in 1854, Henry Thoreau published Walden. Uh, from the 1880s onward, English romantics like Olivia Hill and Edward Carpenter articulated ideas about saving nature and humans in light of the Industrial Revolution. In the late 1890s and early 1900s, the first big green organizations were created, namely the National Audubon Society and the Sierra Club, organizations that to this day are a part of you know, the big 10 environmental groups that we talk about and engage with all the time. Uh, we had US President Theodore Roosevelt, who after becoming president in 1901, used his authority to protect wildlife and public lands by creating the United States Forest Service and establishing national forests, federal bird reserves, and national parks. 19, in 1962, Rachel Carson published the book Silent Spring, which warned folks of the adverse impacts of DDT. April 22nd, 1970, we had the first Earth Day celebration, and actually this past year, I believe it was the 50th anniversary of that celebration. In the 1970s, there was just this prominent decade of environmental laws being passed, and we saw the establishment of the Environmental Protection Agency, and onwards, and as people say, the rest is history, but it really isn't. And I talk about this history because it's not 
incorrect. It's a true history, but it leaves things out and it does so intentionally. And what's usually left out is the histories of oppression and subjugation that have allowed for a lot of these landmark um, things to happen. What's usually left out of these stories is the indigenous removal that was necessary for public lands like the national parks to become the national parks as we know it. Uh, we don't talk about the way that segregationist laws and policies intentionally kept people of color from experiencing green space, including our national parks, and how that history continues to inform who shows up and who doesn't in those spaces, and also in the way that most of the big environmental policies and laws that were passed in the 1970s, while incredibly important and continue to be so, paid too little attention to the distributive effects of environmental policy. That, even with the swaths of laws passed in the 1970s, still we've seen that communities of color and the poor have continued to bear the brunt of environmental depredation. So the truth is, I haven't always known this counter history, the very small piece of history that I just talked about and we'll go into depth a little bit more here. In fact, most of my life, I didn't even know what environmental justice was, let alone what environmentalism really truly meant. And I never really pondered it or took the time to um, because I just felt like it didn't involve me. All I knew was what I felt, and what I felt was that if a history and contemporary movement doesn't involve my histories or interact with the issues that come up and are the ones that I deal with and care for on a daily basis, well, why should I show up on a daily basis, if at all? I often felt really conflicted. I felt as though the environmental movement was one full of contradictions, especially in being one that totes in everything is connected organizing principle. Yet conversations regarding poverty and racism that were the ones that, I guess you could say, radicalized me in my youth and really established this longstanding commitment to public service those were not the same conversations that were being had in environmental spaces that I encountered. And I kept wondering, why have environmental problems traditionally adhered to a woods and water view um, while seemingly ignoring the importance of neighborhoods and cities, particularly places where you find a lot of people of color? So I guess, how did I get here? Um, I'm now 22 years old, arguably a washed up college student. A lot has changed. Um, I decided to major in environmental studies in college, uh, and I'm now studying environmental governance in the United Kingdom, and people refer to me as an environmental leader. However, if I'm being completely honest, I'm still faced with the same conflict, but not necessarily the same conflict. I'll say I'm, I'm still faced with a fundamental conflict, and I'll go into that right now. I know what the environmental movement can be, or rather what it should be. Because I believe that this movement has a fundamental role to play in crafting a just future, particularly in an age uh, where we have an impending climate crisis. And as uh, people continue to suffer at the hands of capitalism and impending uh, and current poverty. Um, and I, I feel as though this movement truly is one that is bound to this general organizing principle that everything is connected and as a movement that understands the importance of ecological connectivity, it must be willing to embrace an intersectional movement and framework. So today I'm gonna to give y'all a brief overview of my journey in reframing the movement as one invested in fighting for people and the planet. Um, hopefully give you a brief history lesson and uh, give some tips on how um, y'all as individuals, as people are part of organizations and communities can work to make this movement an anti-racist one. So I think it's important to begin um, talking about these things within the framing of my own life and my own journey in becoming an anti-racist environmentalist. So uh, this picture is me when I was five. I think that was one of my first days of school and it's one of my favorite photos of myself and totally not related, but it's just an adorable picture. Um, so I was born in Western Massachusetts. I only spent, I think, like a night there, so it almost doesn't count. <laughs> and I was raised 
in the northeast corner of the state. I spent the first 16 years of my life split between Putnam and Pomfret, Connecticut. For those of you that aren't familiar with that side of the state, it's called the Quiet Corner. corner. Um, I was born, uh, I'm actually the second born to two Canyon immigrants. Uh, I'm a Scorpio and I love the color green. Red and back. <laughs> um, but in all that, I felt as though I grew up wedged between two histories. In school, I learned that the black agricultural experience was one of subjugation, one that was riddled by centuries of slavery, sharecropping, and exhausted land practices. But at home, I knew a different story. So as I said, I'm the second born to two king immigrants. And uh, according to the oral history, my family has always been farmers. And both my parents grew up on farms. And as far as they know, we've always been farmers. In fact, I think my siblings and I are the first in our bloodline not to grow up on a farm, even though I was surrounded by farms living in the quiet corner. Um, when my mom first immigrated to the state, uh, she found home in this history and in this ancestry, and she decided to create a garden with my grandmother. And she, well, according to her, her story of this, was, uh, she spent weeks hovered over this plot that just seemed totally, um, you know, useless and as though it couldn't be much. And she saw something special in, in that plot and hovered over that plot for weeks on end until she was able to transform it into this fertile garden of familiarity, as she called it. And as I grew up and as I saw her work and spend a lot of her free time in that garden, I also found a lot of belonging in that act of love. And I spent a lot of my early years, particularly my early summers, elbows deep in that whole soil. I was definitely more of a nuisance than anything, but that was my first interaction with the physical environment and the first time I was able to connect the environment as one of being loved, particularly because the vegetables that she would cook would be put right into the Kenyan dishes I grew up on. However, I didn't see this interaction as one that was qualifying or to be an environmentalist, pretty much. You see, for me, environmentalism always existed in this ivory tower of privilege, power, and whiteness. As I said like three times, I grew up in the quiet corner, which is a place that is engulfed with green space and wilderness. It's arguably one of the most beautiful places in the state of Connecticut and in New England in general. However, I never saw myself represented in the way environmentalism was presented to me, even though it literally surrounded me. Regardless of the manifestation from the way that I understood environmental activists, environmental educators, climate scientists, science teachers, regardless, I never really saw myself in those things because I never saw other people of color in those spaces, nor did I ever hear a narrative discussed by those folks that involved in my life and the things that I felt were highly intertwined with the way that I experienced the world. I spent the majority of my life disconnected from the word environmentalist and pretty intentionally so. I remember there were a couple times when I was younger where people would be like, well, I'm an environmentalist, are you? And I was like, um, I think I care about the polar bears, but I wouldn't call myself an environmentalist. Um, and this did change. I, to this day, I do call myself an environmentalist, but the reason why I was able to do so was because I stumbled into an environmental science course my junior year of high school. So um, growing up, as many children of immigrants, you know, my parents were like, okay, this child's gonna be the engineer, this child's gonna be the doctor, and this, you know, <laughs> the American dream. So I was the doctor child, or was supposed to be, and I took chemistry and I was awful. Like literally the worst chemistry student you have ever met. And I just in that moment, understanding that chemistry would be a part of my college career, I was like, there is no way I can do this myself. So I had a predicament. I needed to fulfill one more science course. And the only thing that fit in my schedule was environmental science. And I remember looking at it and being like, well, it's only a new semester. Can't be that bad. And I can say now that that course completely changed my life. And that was largely because, one, I got really, really lucky with my teacher, Mrs. Rose. Shout out to her. Um, but also in the YouTube video that I stumbled upon. So in that class, we briefly talked about environmentalism and how it intersected with our relationship in the environment across a race gradient or socioeconomic gradient. And I 
was kind of interested in it, but I decided one day, I guess I was bored, I went on YouTube and typed in environmentalism, race, and something like that, and came across this video. And it was a TED Talk by Peggy Shepard, who was the executive director of We Act. And in seconds, I was hooked. Um, that was the first time I ever encountered the term environmental justice. It was the first time that I ever really was able to just sit and listen to the way that race and socioeconomic, race and socioeconomic status um, triangulate the environmental destruction that people experience in the U.S. and abroad. And I quite literally felt as though these scales had just fallen from my eyes. Um, and it was actually in that moment that I became frustrated in a different way. I felt as though now I could say, well, I guess I am an environmentalist. Like if everything really is connected, and if people of color are experiencing environmental degradation, first and worst in this country, how can I not care about the environment? Because if I care about my community, if I care about my loved ones, if I care about myself, of course I care about these things. But I was frustrated because here I was, I think 16 years old, and this was the first time that I had this light bulb go off in my head. And for all I knew, considering the conversations that I'd had with my family and other folks of color in my life, who just like me felt as though environmentalism was a thing for rich white people, I felt really frustrated because I knew that there had to be a reason why we felt this way. And I felt as though if we really were going to deal with the climate crisis as I began to really learn what that meant, that we would have to really reframe the way that we were engaging this movement. But I also understood that that probably had something to do with the way that the movement was set up, which led me into this whole internal reflection of, well, I grew up in the quiet corner, I grew up around wilderness, I grew up around everything that is pretty fundamental, uh, part of the How to Become an Environmentalist 101 book, but I never really experienced the same, I guess, uh, reckoning that I guess the people I grew up with had younger than me. So that frustration actually led me to majoring in environmental studies at UConn. I said, well, if people in my community aren't talking about environmentalism, well, I'm going to have an entire degree where I learn about these issues and then come back and basically make every person of color know environmentalist. Um, it didn't really work out that way. Um, I think things are much more complicated. But uh, to my surprise, um, those problems didn't solve themselves at UConn, but I did learn how to navigate it myself. As a buddy environmental scholar, I spent uh, my undergraduate career searching for my face in the textbooks in my classrooms. We read staple environmental texts like I Stand Count, The Almanac, and Desert Solitaire, which illuminated humanless landscapes that magnified the interests of my classmates and oftentimes left mine in the dust. Um, we rarely talked about environmental justice and I eagerly, every semester, awaited the opportunity to learn from an instructor of color or to dive into traditional ecological knowledge, but that time never came and only came when I did electives that were totally outside the departments that were a part of the environmental studies you know, umbrella. And the sparse mentions of black history that did seem very reminiscent of the conversations of subjugation and, and uh, tenant farming that I had experienced you know, in high school. So I couldn't help but feel alone and frustrated. I felt as though my classmates and professors were, were growing in perspective. I was stunted with this exhaustion of constantly investing all of my emotional and intellectual labor and in trying to figure out how to fit my life into conversations and discussions in my classroom. And I found myself asking, how can I remain in a movement that struggles to find worth in my life? Because if we're not there, then we must not matter. And I did find solace. And I found solace not in my classrooms, but I found solace in the research that I was able to do outside of that, the research I was able to do in my electives and being able to dive back into the reason why I'd gotten into environmentalism in the first place, environmental justice. I mean, this time I took a much deeper dive. I began turning to social movement leaders that helped facilitate the conversations regarding power and race relations in the first place. This was justice leaders um, of the civil rights movement, people like Ella Baker, Dr. Melissa King, James Baldwin, uh, Mother Teresa, and folks that have come along the way. And I found that this language of progress and inclusivity did exist, just not within my 
climate science textbooks and, and the policy briefs that we're reading. And I found that that language of environmentalism, of an environmentalism that fundamentally acknowledged and centered all of us, existed, but it just didn't exist uh, in ways that were provided credit. And I soon realized that I had just been a victim to an incomplete environmental history. I realized that a simplistic version of history can give the impression that all Americans have a shared understanding and agree about how people should interact with nature. And I was definitely not exempt from that assumption. So um, I'm going to share some of the things that I learned in my research and some of the things that have really provided this foundation for me to reconsider the genealogy of the environmental movement, which I have felt have been, has been really, really fundamental in reframing this movement as well invested in, in the vitality of all of us. Now, I know that presentations can be really, really uh, boring sometimes. <laughs> Uh, and you know, you know, I'm a grad student that sits on Zoom for eight hours a day, so I completely feel that. So I wanted to make it a bit more interactive and a little more interesting. So I wanted to make it a game with the hope that there are some history buffs in the audience. So this is a game called Name the Environmental Leader. So it's going to be basically I'm gonna give you know one or two sentences about an environmental leader that is oftentimes are more lives within this movement and we're going to see if any of y'all know who these people are. So uh, this person is, I can't even see the chat because, oh yeah I can. So this person is known as being the father of the national parks and this person was an early advocate for the preservation of wilderness in the United States of America and was the first president of the Sierra Club. I saw someone was from the Sierra Club so I know that someone Right now, yes, yeah. Oh no, that was a good guess, though. But it is, it is uh, John Muir. So John Muir, as the previous slide said, you know he was a fundamental thought leader of the environmental movement. I mean, he gets the title Father of the National Parks, was a huge proponent for the creation of the national park system and was the first president of the Sierra Club and also helped create the tenants that the Sierra Club followed, but I believe have been reconstructed um, to some degree in the past several years. However, John Muir also was a racist. So on his thousand mile walks to the Gulf uh, in 1867, through the lands that had been devastated by war, he spoke of Negroes, as he called them, as being largely lazy and easygoing and unable to pick as much cotton as he would. He described the Mohawk, the indigenous people of Yosemite, as being dirty and altogether hideous, his words, um, and that they seem to have no rightful place in this landscape. Okay, so we're going to do the next environmental leader. So you might understand the, the reason why we're playing this game. Uh, this person was the 26th president of the United States and he used his authority to establish 150 national forests, 51 federal bird reserves, four national game preserves, preserves sorry, five national parks, and 18 national monuments on over 230 million acres of public land. I think someone got it before. Yeah. Yep. So Harold, you got it, and I believe some of what yeah, and Jet got it too. This was President Theodore Roosevelt. So uh, President Theodore Roosevelt was obviously uh, someone that was very, very invested in conservation and arguably is one of the reasons why public land or protecting public land has been arguably a priority um, from the point of view of the federal government. And he also was someone that arguably was a racist. Uh, Roosevelt praised the 1916 book, The Passing of the Great Race, uh, which warned against the decline of the Nordic peoples um, and was described by Aldous Hitler as his Bible. There are also many other circumstances that, uh, you know, ground my reasoning for assuming that he probably was a racist, but we'd be here all day. I suggest came to that your free time as well. Um, I also realized I probably gave some of the answers and the things that I've said, but 
Anyways, uh, this other person, he is best known for his book, Walden, A Reflection Upon Simple Living in Natural Surroundings, and his essay, Civil Disobedience. This one might be a bit harder. Anyone? Yes, yes, all of y'all just got it. So y'all were right, Henry David Thoreau. Um, in his influential 1862 Atlantic essay, Walking, he wrote, I think that the farmer displaces an Indian even because he redeems the meadow and so makes himself stronger in some respects more natural. And I, yes, this is the last person. This one is much harder and I'll be very, very uh, impressed if someone knows who this person was, but this person was an American forester and politician. Um, I believe this person was a governor of Pennsylvania and he served as the fourth chief of the U.S. Division of Forestry and as the first head of the United States Forest Service and as head of the National Conservation Committee and was appointed by President Roosevelt. Oh, wow. Yeah. That is correct. Gifford Minot, uh, this person was uh, had a prominent role on the advisory council of the American Eugenicist Commission. And I saw in the comments that other folks were talking about Aldo Leopold, who also was a racist. Um, but I, I figured it might get a bit tiresome to continue playing this game. Also, y'all are really great at the game. Um, so why is it important to discuss uh, the racist histories of, I guess, a select few of folks? I think it's important, particularly in discussing these folks, um, because they continue, as I said, to be immortalized in the environmental movement to this day, and because the way that they conceptualize nature and wilderness as being racialized concepts are not ones that exist only in the past, but they actually continue to inform the present. This is an excerpt from the book Black Faces, White Spaces by Dr. Carolyn Finney. I highly recommend this book. Um, and in uh, her book, I believe in the chapter Bumboozled, she says the following, prominent views of nature are well not unified, draw from the experiences of those in a position of influence and establish legitimacy for their ideas institutionally and culturally. Furthermore, these narratives, which contribute to the American environmental imagery, are grounded in the values, beliefs, and attitudes of the individuals who construct them. These attitudes and beliefs manifest in our everyday environmental practices, affecting our livelihoods and our interactions with each other. So it's important to talk about these things, not because we want to erase this history. I started this game with uh, discussing very real and arguably valid reasons why those folks are propped up and understood as environmental leaders. Their work has, for better or worse, been a part of environmental history. And reconsidering the, de the genealogy of the environmental movement doesn't remove that. However, there has to be an acknowledgement that history has erased others. And the fact that we prop up a select few, all of whom typically are white men, does let us know that there are other histories that have been erased and intentionally done so. And I believe that the environmental justice movement seeks to address it, and the environmental justice movement has a history of doing so. So what is environmental justice? So environmental justice is an important part of the struggle to improve and maintain a clean and healthful environment, especially for those who have traditionally lived, worked, and played closest to sources of pollution. There are a lot of different definitions, but essentially environmental justice and the frameworks that guide it uh, in historically and contemporarily call for there to be a focus on distributive justice and the way that we understand and create environmental policies and laws, and also call that all people have the opportunity to have a seat at the environmental decision-making table, a reality that hasn't been actualized yet. It's important as well in the, in the line that I said before about the environmental justice movement arguably being one that works to reconsider um, the environmental movements, mainstream genealogy, because 
The movement itself emerged as a critique of the mainstream environmental movement. So most people understand the EJ movement to have emerged in response to the 1982 dumping of PCB toxins in the predominantly black community of Warren County, North Carolina. And this movement is one that has been rooted in opposing the power dynamics that make that, um, I just, that made plastic possible, yes, which also goes back to my article. But particularly, um, Warren County and the folks that led to the organizing that happened in response and did create uh, a national movement and even an international conversation about the way that race intersects and the way that we experience the environment and how in the United States particularly, race is the number one indicator of one's proximity to toxic waste um, facilities. Um, it's important to talk about that because oftentimes the EJ movement isn't placed in the timelines that are discussed of the environmental movement. I don't believe it was even placed in the uh, brief overview that I posted before. And it's important to talk about that because the environmental justice movement, as I said, uh, was created in response to the mainstream environmental movement that even though, right, in the 1970s, was able to pass all these environmental policies and laws that are so important to this day, did not have a distributive um, justice component and allowed for um, folks, particularly folks that don't have a lot of political clout, that don't have a lot of social capital, have allowed for those folks, as shown in Warren County, and as we see today, are still the communities that bear the brunt of environmental degradation and climate change. So um, the environmental justice movement uh, has been championed primarily by BIPOC, which are Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, and works to address the statistical fact. The fact that people who work, play, and sleep in America's most polluted environments are commonly people of color and the poor. EJ advocates have shown that this is no accident. Communities of color, which are often poor, so right, the intersection of these Various groups are largely targeted to host facilities that have negative environmental impacts, say landfills, dirty industrial plants, or truck deposits. The statistics have uh, provided clear evidence of what the movement rightfully calls environmental racism, and people have been battling this injustice for decades. So this is the end of the brief history part that I was talking about before. I will say I am learning myself as well, and I'm no expert at uh, environmental history just yet. I'm still a student, but I think it's important for us all as we attempt to really ensure that we are anti-racist ourselves, but also ensure that the environmental movement is anti-racist, and we understand the histories that have gotten us to a place where the environmental movement hasn't necessarily been one that has been inclusive to us all. I've listed some things that I have read in the past and continue to reference as a way to be literate in the history that we that we understand and the histories that we don't understand. So um, hopefully at the end of this, I'll be able to find a way to send this to everyone. If not, uh, maybe I'll just stay here for a little bit so y'all can write some of these down. Um, I will also say that Dorcia Taylor, who I believe right now was just now moved to Yale University and is based in New Haven, anything by her is phenomenal. She is truly an intersectional environmental historian and someone that I look up to a lot, um, as well as, as everyone else here. At the end, I guess I can also copy and paste and put that in the chat if that's helpful. So why is it important in talking about history? Um, like I said, I think oftentimes when people discuss history and, and talk about how figures that we didn't know were racist were racist, the number one thing that I hear back and have gotten personally well, is, well, you can't change history, so you know, just deal with it. Um, well, I think it's important to understand that um, it's important to understand a full understanding of history and a truthful understanding of history. But like I said, understanding the racist roots of the environmental movement 
allow us to understand the contemporary implications. So according to environmental law scholar Jedediah Purdy, who I believe his paper, The Law Environmental Justice Movement, was one that I referenced uh, before, uh, he has written that the white-led conservation movement is one that continues to sit in tension with the environmental protection of communities of color. As a result, mainstream environmentalism has historically centered the interests of the mostly white and wealthy at the exclusion of the lived experiences of people of color and indigenous folks. And there are a lot of different reports that have been put out showing this, including the State of Diversity Environmental Organizations, mainstream NGOs, foundations, and government agencies. So in this report, which is also known as the Green Report 2.0, which comes out every year since 2014, they discuss and have really highlighted the green ceiling, which is this really, really interesting circumstance that, in which the United States, despite increasing in its racial diversity, has not broken the 12 to 16% green ceiling for involvement of folks of color. So even though folks of color, according to the 2010 uh, U.S. Census, will get an updated number um, hopefully soon, people of color um, make up 36% of the U.S. population. We haven't exceeded 16% um, of the staff in any organizations uh, in the mainstream environmental movement from NGOs, foundations, and government agencies. And this is uh, what it kind of looks like. And as you see, um, it's it's pretty, it's pretty sad. Um, on the conversation of contemporary implications, um, there is a very real reality that in not understanding history, the contemporary implications can be dangerous and have been. Um, this past summer, right, the environmental movement along with the world watched as Amy Cooper criminalized Christian Cooper, a black birder and innocent bystander in Central Park of all places. Um, and essentially um, identified him as being the person that did not belong in that space and was dangerous, even though he was just burning. Um, and you know, when 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 this whole went down, when, when this whole thing went down, and I I was looking at climate Twitter and environmental Twitter, um, I couldn't help but notice that there were a lot of stark parallels in the way that people were discussing what went on, right? Um, as someone that is has been involved in a lot of conservation biology and I guess a scientific part of the environmental community. Um, organizations and labs are really, really good about speaking the language of diversity, equity, and inclusion in grant applications. I've often been an intern doing that um, and in job descriptions. Um, however, a lot of the folks you know, assessing this situation really didn't have the collective lived experience to be aware of the tradition of black criminalization of the outdoors, let alone have any safety protocols for students or employees required to complete field work, let alone people, especially black people that are just interested in being in green space. And I thought that was a bit troubling because even though I've grown up in the quiet corner my entire life, I don't engage with slash go to a lot of popular green spaces in this area because I don't feel safe a lot of the time. And I know that there likely could be someone that comes across me, doesn't know who I am, and sees me as a threat. And that has definitely kept me from, I guess, experiencing everything that is to offer in the place that I grew up in and the place that I also call home. Um, and that's just a part of the contemporary um, implications of this racist environmental history, and the fact that if people knew about the American tradition of criminalization, specifically BIPOC criminalization in the outdoors, and the way that laws and policies have kept us out, and how that history has continued to create this tension with how we show up or choose not to show up in those places, perhaps instances like this wouldn't be as surprising, and perhaps people would have protocols put in place to protect folks of color if they chose to engage in those things. I think it's absolutely a reason why a lot of folks of color may not feel as comfortable in the environmental movement because a lot of the activities that are, you know, correspondent with that definition in that community aren't always as accessible to us. And then lastly, 
funding priorities. So like I talked about with the Big Green, um, the Big Green is basically a nickname that is often used to describe the biggest environmental organizations in the U.S. And oftentimes their priorities from funding programmatically are ones that have this trickle down effect to the generalized understanding of what the environmental movement does and how other organizations um, on smaller scales um, interact. And uh, the Big Green are mostly highly heavily staffed and they have abundant resources and are well funded. Um, however, of these 10 that are listed here, uh, zero of them uh, primarily focus on environmental justice. So when I talk about all these things, uh, oftentimes people say, so what do we do? What are the things that we can do moving forward? And I think that there isn't one answer, but I think that we have to first begin with embracing an environmentalism that doesn't just fight for the vitality and health of our planet, but uh, fights for a future for all of us and fights for people as well. And that is uh, intersectional environmentalism. So intersectional environmentalism, if you haven't heard it, of it is a term that has really um, become quite popular in the past couple of months. It was coined by Leah Thomas. Um, and it's an inclusive version of environmentalism that advocates for people on the planet. And it says that in, in acknowledging the intersectionality that is inherent to how people experience the environment, it also calls for solutions that appreciate our varied experiences. And applying this framework to the plastic crisis amongst all the other crises that are under the umbrella of environmentalism, intersectional environmentalism calls on us to reframe disposability in the hopes that we create solutions that are built upon a foundation of equity. Like I said, there's not one answer. Um, but as a history buff and as someone that really believes in the power of history um, as being a tool to really imagine what the future can look like, I think a good first step is to rediscover a more inclusive environmental history. So I figured that um, I wouldn't have enough time to play the environmental leader to, uh, to know game again. But here are some BIPOC environmental leaders to know, folks that um, are just as important to know as the other folks that I talked about before. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois, um, he is someone that for a long time I didn't know was an environmentalist, but actually in rediscovering his work, um, I found he was an environmental leader himself and who wrote of the ways to facilitate a morally beneficial interactions with nature um, and also was uh, someone that was famous for contesting racist practices and ideologies that keep black people from interacting with the land. And it's also really interesting to note that uh, Du Bois's New England was the same New England that Thoreau wrote about, and only one of them was granted the title of environmental thought leader. And the rest of the folks that I listed here were actually all influential in the creation of the national park system. And Oftentimes, the only folks that we hear about are uh, Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir and a couple others, but um, for a long time, I didn't know who these people are. So I think something that we can do is give people their due time and learn about the histories of the people that were a part of history and having that, uh, having that new frame allows us to understand how we can create a movement that involves people of various backgrounds. So other solutions, I guess, for yourself, your organization, and or your community, I think it's important to read, learn, and prepare to be uncomfortable. Um, redefining an environmental history is not something that should be taken lightly. It can be really confusing. It's still quite confusing for me and oftentimes makes me really, really frustrated. Um, but it's also been really, um, enlightening for me and finally see myself as a part of the history of this movement and gives me hope that there is tangible ways that this movement can be one that everyone sees themselves in. I think another thing is understanding white privilege in the outdoors, uh, particularly um, in having people on trails that look like you uh, and having dominant representation in outdoor media and outdoor recreational jobs and professions. I think it's important to uh, make regular donations to BIPOC-led environmental organizations. 
taking the intersectional environmentalist pledge, passing the mic and listening, um, and listening without ego or defensiveness and uh, without minimizing the experiences of BIPOC that are in the movement and also not in the movement. I think it's also holding yourself accountable to do inner anti-racist work without having people of color tell you or teach you. Um, this is a very short list, but I did that intentionally and I thought about making it longer. But again, I think this is a journey that we all have to take personally and can't be one that one has a universal solution for everyone, um, but has to be one that uh, is proactive and uh, spurred by your own uh, need to do it. So uh, I think it's important to end with saying that intersectional environmentalism isn't a fad. It isn't something to engage with right now because it's a hot, sexy topic. It's really important and required actually for creating a just climate future that includes all of us. And only in embracing this framework do we have a chance to create a movement of integrity and one that is made in the image of all of us, which is so important in light of an impending climate crisis, in light of needing to restructure our systems in a world that is willing to fight for all of us. Thank you so much. We're going to bring in David Mayan and Harold Bailey now. Uh, if I can get Harold's image to come back up. And Let's see. Harold, where did you go? Oh, there he is. I'm here. Hi. Hi. Um, oh. And then you're gone. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everybody, for for sticking with us during this little technical issue here. Um, as we said before, David Mann is with Sustainable Westport and Harold is with um, Team Westport. And I know that they had some questions for you, Wawa, and we also have some audience questions. So David, if you'd like to ask your question first while I try to get Harold's uh, image back up here. Sure. So thank you so much, Wawa. That really was an amazing both personal history and thoughtful look from a different perspective than what is in the canonical history of environmentalism uh, for us to, to ponder. And you've laid out environmentalism as a white narrative and a white conception of the environment. And I've heard you previously talk about uh, and expand upon the alternative environmental leaders that you might consider and language that, that might be used to change that narrative. And you've specifically referenced the language of abolitionists as mm -hmm. language that can be powerful in thinking about uh, environmentalism and building an inclusive narrative and i was wondering if you could expand on that yeah um i i think i, I did leave that out um and i'm not exactly sure why um but it, i find that a lot of the inspiration that i get today i think oftentimes you know everyone wants to know how do people stay inspired in this past year and my for me personally i found the most inspiration from abolitionists and I find it really interesting because when I close my eyes and I hear the language and verbiage that is um, being talked about in abolitionist spaces about building a just future that um, uh, in a world that that is for all of us, it's quite literally the language that the climate slash environmental movement is seeking today. However, oftentimes those communities aren't necessarily seen as the ones that intersect. And I think when it comes to you know, this organizing principle of everything is connected. There is a requirement on the behalf of the environmental movement to understand that there are other movements that perhaps are better equipped with discussing the very thing that we're seeking and struggling to talk about and how coalition building outside of the, I guess, confines that have been that of the environmental movement for the past century. Um, 
why that isn't working and needs to be expanded further. Great. Um, Harold, do you have a question for Wawa to get us started? Yeah, I do. I Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, good. Great. Uh, Wawa, thank you so much for the presentation and, and for the thought leadership around this. What you're describing, though, is very, very similar to what we've been talking about in terms of the two trains running anti-racism versus racism for the last 400 years in this country. And we're all at this, we're kind of at this inflection point. Uh, and, and a number of the problems you're talking about are the problems of going in and doing the internal work that we all have to do around race in the country. Mike, I, I, I was, so there's kind of a DNA that you're talking about, a DNA in the environmental movement and environmental research that, that you talk about historically. I'm wondering, since many of us don't really, I never actually connected the environmental research with the environmental movement necessarily, how would having uh, a completely equitable representation uh, in environmental, in the environmental research community affect what 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 would the model look like if we had that? How would how would things be affected? That's a really great question. Um, I think my understanding right of environmental research and when we think of advocacy or evidence based advocacy, right? Oftentimes people, especially with the environmental movement, turn to scientists and researchers as being the folks that are going to create. Um, reports and do research that helps inform how the movement works programmatically, right? And what we see right now is that the racialized conceptions of wilderness and nature are often the same ones that um, really dictate what type of environments are deemed as those worthy to research or prioritize. As I said before in the pres presentation, there has been this historic adherence to a woods and water environment, which is completely valid and I'm not taking away from that, but there has been this stark um, prioritization of that in which a lot of the funding in the environmental movement and a lot of the programmatic um, focuses are on things like wilderness and preservation and, and protection of public land. Again, very important concepts, but then when we look at things like the breakdown of the big green organizations, you can see how that research and continuing to perpetuate similar research questions and things to talk about and look at how that systematically leaves out environments such as those in cities, such as urban environments, such as environments that have a lot of people of color and how that continues to, um, you know, perpetuate these dynamics. So I think what to answer your question, the way that we can curb that is I think there needs to be a lot more prioritization of pipelines that allow for folks of color to become researchers. Um, I think oftentimes people uh, see science and formulating research questions of ones that are void of, uh, you know, identity and can't be objective. But, you know, we don't leave our identities aside when we decide to research something. Um, and I think having people and giving them the opportunity to research their own communities and do research on things that the literature doesn't exist, I think that's really important. And that has actually grounded my work as an academic in which my research is looking at how colorism impacts the way that young black girls don't want to experience outdoor um, work in environmental ed, and the literature just doesn't exist and has never been done before. So I think having more folks of color who understand um, the way that lack of access intimately impacts our own relationship can really push our community forward. So, so picking up on that, you, you were talking about the environmental movement as not having been anti-racist and this narrative of woods and water that doesn't fit the diversity of our population. And you, you emphasize in your thinking people's role as part of the environment, sort of an ecological view. How does this ecologically focused view utilize and how can an equity lens and how can that further 
the movement and a just future. Can you reframe that? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I I you, t you talked about people, people's role as part of the environment is critical to environmentalism before um, and as being different from the sort of canonical woods and water narrative that hasn't proved to be anti-racist. How can an ecological view, a view where people are part of the, seen as part of the environment, be critical to a just future that that is racially just and environmentally just? Yeah, I think that's a really great question. I think the first thing I'd say is that the opposite of that has been done, where there's been this really stark um, separation of humans and nature, and that is a part of this racist history that I'm talking about. Um, I didn't really dive into this, but a lot of the folks and founding thought leaders of the environmental movement that were eugenicists and racists, they conceptualize nature and wilderness as being a place for the Nordic peoples and the white race to go and be outside of and being away from like people of color and, and poor people and saw and conceptualized a nature that didn't really involve them but was just a temporary refuge, right? So that separation was there and I think in embracing a true environmental justice movement, I think it also involves uh, integrating non-human species into that conception. I think a just climate future in fighting right for this intersectional environmentalism involves uplifting the most vulnerable. And yes, that is particularly within human societies, uh, oftentimes are people of color and the poor, but it also involves animals as well. It also involves the fact that animals don't have standing legally and as climate change continues to be this huge issue that it is, they also are, there are so many different species that we don't even know that exist that are experiencing the brunt of a climate crisis that has been perpetuated by human activity. So I think in seeing ourselves as a part of this truly connected movement, uh, we have to uh, have one that rivals and isn't one that is a place for speciesism as well. Great. I'm going to jump in, Harold. Um, if I could just ask a few of the audience questions, um, given the time that we have right now. Um, we have a, several questions who ask how predominantly white community organizations can reach out and work with communities of color. What is the best way, do you think, to reach out to those groups and and work together? And that's a really good question. I think the I think that has a lot of great intention behind it. However, I'd say the first line of priority should be a look at your organization's history and um, a deep dive into why right now is the time to reach out to those communities. Why has your organization not worked with uh, BIPOC-led environmental justice organizations in the past, and there needs to be an understanding that that same question that I'm asking is perhaps going to be the same question that those organizations are thinking of. Why now? Um, so I think there needs to be uh, a deep dive into that. And I think before, I think oftentimes people talk about, you know, creating this pipeline for having more people of color involved in the environmental movement. I think that's really important. But another element of that that often doesn't get a lot of light is the fact that the environmental movement, particularly in the workforce, doesn't do a good job at retaining uh, folks of color. So it needs to be a conversation and deep dive into the work culture within your organization before reaching out to folks of color, because perhaps that could be a problem working together uh, moving forward. And then once that's done, um, I think reaching out to people authentically and truly, and perhaps even with an air of understanding of the problematic tendency that had previously existed in not having that communication in the first place. Great. So on the flip side of that, we also have a question from a woman who is working with the Sierra Club in Bridgeport. And she asks, how do we voice, um, a, let me just read what she writes. Um, with the, She's working with the Sierra Club. 
And while this brings me her joy and a lot of challenges, um, they they want the center black, brown, indigenous voices um, to, to work and they would love to get them to be patient and put aside some tendencies that do not allow for equity and liberation work. Their support is needed, but only at the queue of the community. Any advice on how to voice this? So it's sort of the opposite of that first question. This question in the chat, I'm trying to find it, or no? Uh, no, it's not. It's in the question and answers. Um, so if, if I heard you correctly, um, she's asking how the Sierra Club internally can work? No, I think she's asking how, do the, how does her group get the other groups to sort of wait until they have it under control or yeah. until they're ready to, for that help. That's, that's a tough one. Um, and I mean, that's a part of the dynamic, right? And that is a part of that power dynamic as well of telling people to wait when right now folks of color, like we can't wait. Um, so that might contradict what I'm saying. I think, again, I, I, would, I would implore um, folks like the Sierra Club and the person that asked the question before about their environmental organization to really take a deep dive into why this is the time to do it. And perhaps if that question is being asked now, ponder whether or not that collaboration should happen in the exact way that you're looking for. Perhaps I'd say the best way to reach out to people is to ask them what are the best ways that we can support you. I think oftentimes collaboration, when there is a power dynamic in play, can create partnerships that reinforce that. I think organizations like the Sierra Club have more resources and tend to than a lot of you know, small EJ organizations. So the best thing that can be done now while that wait period and while there can be more intimate collaborations in the future, right now it's just about spreading resources and supporting the existing work that already is being done by the by those organizations. Terrific, thank you. Harold, I know you have another question. Um, so I think we have time for one more um, before before we lose the audience. <laughs> Terrible question here. Uh, but, and, and this, I'll just follow up on what we were just talking about and say, the biggest problem we have right now in confronting racism overall is that issue of parallel organizations like church yeah. or faith groups that are historically segregated up to this point, racially, trying to figure out how to work together. And uh, so I'll just posit that going back and looking at histories of both organizations and then sitting down honestly to confront those histories is critical if you're going to, to work. Uh, Otherwise, you literally end up talking past each other exactly. because they're ending of, of, of why that segregation has continued to perpetuate itself over a period of time. So I'll just say thank you for, for bringing that to the fore. Terrific. Anything else to wrap up with our panel? Yeah, one of the, one of the other things that I had, and I didn't know that we're trying to wrap up, so maybe if we could keep it brief, but I think that it's something that really should be said. We just had a question about Bridgeport and a project that's occurring in Bridgeport and we're sitting here in Westport and we're in one of, or at least we're virtually sitting here in Westport and we're in one of the most, we're, we're in a, a county that has some of the highest levels of inequality in the country and in the world. And if we're thinking about as you put it, climate justice is racial justice and is about addressing inequality and inequity to reach a just and equitable future. How can Westport and Westporters be part of the solution? That's a good question. Um, I think it all begins with that inner work of trying to figure out how to become an anti-racist and Again, investigating the histories of uh, Westport surrounding 
uh, towns and cities like Bridgeport. I mean, Connecticut is a state that is just rifled with all types of inequalities from, I believe, at the top of the list for income inequality in the country. And I mean, in Connecticut, there are over 600 potential pollution sources in each of our five major cities, Bridgeport, Hartford, New Haven, Stanford, and Waterbury. So this tale of inequity, especially in regards to uh, Westport being this environmentally savvy town and that you know, town over Bridgeport experiencing um, some of the worst environmental racism in the country, I think people need to begin to acknowledge that because I think it's really easy to uh, sit in our bubbles and be comfortable. Um, I think perhaps people need to get out of their houses and drive to Bridgeport, maybe see what's going on a couple miles from where you live and figure out how to be engaged, try to figure out why it often takes people so long to want to go to other communities, oftentimes communities that are uh, predominantly of color. Why do people feel as though those aren't places that are safe for them? I think there's a lot of inner work that needs to be done in order to do any type of big projects or um, collaborations that people try to jump into. And the thing is, you can't jump into those big things without addressing the intimately and ingrained things that are part of the reasons why our cities look the way that they do. Mm. Yeah. Carol, do you agree with that? Very much agree with that. We heard recent comment that to, to kind of categorize it, zip code apartheid. It's, it's, in, in a lot of ways, it's what we have in Fairfield County and much of the state. And that's what we're we're dealing with is getting people to look outside of the bubble. But you can't go outside that bubble until you do that work to understand the history for how we got here. Yeah. Uh, the redlining that was driven by the federal government, and that kind of encouraged uh, uh, covenants in towns. That, that kept us the way we are right now, got us to be the way we are, so that there are these wonderful suburban communities in terms of their affluence, right next to poverty in urban areas that are right next door. And so there's a lot of work that's gotta be done there. And that's why a lot of being able to get down to this niche of, of environmentalism uh, is something that can be done only after we start to get at our overall attitudes about race, our understanding of it, and where we need to go based on that history. So, yep. Okay. Well, I would like to thank all of you on the screen and all of you who came to listen to this fabulous conversation. Um, the library thanks Earth Place, Sustainable Westport, and Team Westport for joining us in this program. Um, remember, you can rewatch this event right here on Crowdcast and we will, all of our organizations will share a link to watch this afterward and um, with Wawa's suggestions for readings. So have a wonderful evening and thank you all so very much.